Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, Jack Jennings has said, you all know there's been a lot of attention and a lot of controversy for obvious reasons around the use of value-added models for teacher evaluation. And what the two organizations we represent, AERA and the National Academy of Education, can bring to this conversation is a hard look at the empirical evidence. A lot of the policy talk sometimes strays away from what we actually know based on actual research findings. And we, in our opinion, the research is actually pretty one-sided. So we're hoping that laying out what we know about value-added models and also about some of the alternative ways of, of uh, conducting teacher evaluation for different purposes will help to clear the air and will help to encourage the formulation of wise policy so we can all work for what we all want, which is the improvement of American education. In our presentations this morning, I hope to clarify some of the pluses and minuses of these of of value-added models in particular. Professor Rothstein will elaborate on that. And Professor Amrine Beardsley will elaborate some of what we know looking at how these models have actually played out in practice. And then Professor Darling Hammond will speak primarily to some of the alternatives to, to value-added models. Uh, value-added models are designed to show how much achievement value teachers add to their students over the course of a school year. There are some old ideas here, but with some new terminology and some new twists. A lot of the factors that influence students, there are a lot of different factors that influence students' test scores. Some of these are random and some are not. Random factors are unpredictable. They average out to zero. That's the important thing. Uh, in other words, they wash out when we average across a lot of students. The non-random factors are things that on average will lean towards some teachers against other teachers. And those are things that persist even when we average across students' test scores. So what a value-added model has to do is disentangle the effects of the teacher from all these other non-random factors, some but not all of which are, are reflected in the student's prior achievement. I'm going to start with just a couple of assumptions here. And as with all kinds of models and all kinds of assumptions, there's a lot of truth in, in where we start. The problem is just pushing some of these obvious truths a little too far. First, we can all agree that some teachers are better than others. But that's not the same as saying that each teacher can be described by a single number that captures his or her effectiveness year after year with one classroom full of students after another, and that can be estimated from students' test scores and used to predict future performance accurately. Likewise, we can all agree that students' standardized test scores measure some important schooling outcomes. But that's not the same as saying that brief, inexpensive tests can locate students on some simple, equal interval achievement scale. It's very difficult, in fact, to take two scores from a year apart on two different tests aligned to different grade level content standards and use those two scores to figure out how much a student has learned over the course of the year. This is a kind of an apples to oranges comparison. And while psycho psychometricians, I'm a psychometrician, sometimes we're a bit arrogant about what we can accomplish, but building vertical scales that allow us to make these kinds of comparisons across time really is a very difficult technical challenge, especially so when we try to retrofit a vertical scale to pre-existing tests. I saw a simplified explanation of value-added models that used an analogy of two gardeners growing oak trees. That presentation was fine as far as it went, but it glossed over some really big problems, some of which are listed here. Think how easy it is to measure the height of a tree or the volume of liquid in a test tube compared to measuring student achievement. Value, variables like height or weight or value, volume and so forth are, are one-dimensional. They're easily measured with equal-sized units. Trees don't influence one another's growth, and test tubes don't talk to one another. But one child with an emotional behavioral disability can influence the learning of an entire classroom full of students. Uh, also, there's no way for a gardener to focus on increasing tree height at the expense of, say, trunk diameter. But in a classroom, if only reading and math are measured, the teacher can focus on those things and ignore history and science. Uh, let me return to the logic of sorting out teacher effects. First of all, as noted, teachers don't all begin the school year at the same point. Initial achievement varies as a function of these factors. You can probably think of others as well. Over the course of a school year, many of these same factors responsible for initial differences continue to operate, influencing the rate of learning. 
In addition, of course, students' achievement gains are influenced by the instruction they receive. Research suggests that the classroom teacher is the most important within school factor affecting student achievement. But this is not the same thing as saying the teacher effects are more powerful than out of school factors. Let me say that again. Teachers are the most powerful in school influence on student learning, but that's not the same thing as saying the teacher effects trump out of school factors. Also, while teachers are one very important within school factor, the teacher is not the only factor in determining the effectiveness of instruction. Evaluated model results depend heavily on what variables are included in the equations they use. Some of the influences listed here might be accounted for by variables like prior test scores or school fixed effects, but others will not be. Moreover, many of these factors are partially under the teacher's control, but not completely. So saying what should be in the statistical model and what shouldn't be is, is a problem, and it's not always clear. Some things are kind of partly in and partly out. The main point here is that controlling for prior year scores is not sufficient. Um, test scores are fuzzy. They fluctuate. They fail to pick up a lot of important learning. And they're affected by sources of invalidity, like drilling kids and test wiseness strategies. In addition, just because students had the same score last year, or even the same score as the past couple of years, doesn't mean they're on the same trajectory. Even if two students had identical mastery over last year's content, that would not they would not necessarily have the same preparation for learning this year's content. Uh, up until now, I focused on the logic of value-added models, and I've raised some questions. I'd like next to turn to some studies that can show us whether the problems I've mentioned are serious or not. Professor Jesse Rothstein will, pre will be presenting some additional evidence and elaborating on some of these concerns. You'll recall my first oversimplifying assumption pertained to the notion that effectiveness was a stable teacher characteristic. That's addressed by evidence concerning the stability of effectiveness estimates, the first bullet. Second, my second simplifying assumption had to do with the power of brief, inexpensive tests to locate students along a one-dimensional achievement scale. Since these tests are fundamental drivers of any value-added model, it's really important to look at them very closely. Um, I probably, a possibly unhelpful aside, um, in my experience, uh, academics from some other disciplines sometimes think that test scores can be used like variables like dollars, say, or that, that have simple properties that are well understood. And in fact, test scores are much, much slippery, much more slippery entities, and there are a lot of problems with using scores in some of the ways that have been proposed. Uh, my third bullet, random assignment, refers to a strong and important assumption required by these models. Uh, Professor Rothstein will have more to say about this in a few minutes. And finally, I've included just two quotes from experts, which are a sample from the Economic Policy Institute briefing on which Linda darling Hammond and I were among the 10 co-authors. That briefing is included in the packets for this morning. Turning then to this first topic, the stability of effectiveness estimates, this question asks whether evaluated model estimates are reliable. Now, it's sometimes said that unreliability in the middle of the scale doesn't matter much because we're interested in identifying extreme cases. But in fact, research shows that these model estimates are, if anything, less accurate for teachers in the tails of the distribution. In a paper published last year, Professor Shosha Newton, Linda Darling Hammond, Ewer Thomas, and I took advantage of a large data set constructed for another project to compare teachers' value added scores across different value added model specifications, across different courses the same teacher was taking, and also across successive years of instruction with different classes. We started out quite optimistic in this project. We were bullish on the use of these value-added models to tease out the effectiveness of teachers and then wanted to relate these empirically determined effectiveness estimates to other qualities of the teacher's instruction, which came in the context of this larger study from careful study of, of classroom observations and, and other sources of information about their prior preparation and so on. So in this model, we ranked teachers and grouped them into 10 deciles in different ways and then compared the results. This slide shows how much teacher effectiveness estimates bounced around. And from these numbers, uh, we were forced to conclude that any simple notion of effectiveness as a stable, enduring quality of individual teachers simply did not hold up to careful scrutiny. In this, uh, I think we shared our disappointment with that of many other researchers who've gone down the same path. 
This is a particularly dramatic case from the Newton et al. study showing how an experienced high school teacher received wildly different effectiveness ratings teaching the same course to two groups of students, even with statistical controls for school and for student demographics, in addition to statistical controls for prior year test scores. The year one class included higher proportions of low-income Hispanic and English learner students. And with that class, the teacher's effectiveness ranking was at the bottom of the distribution. The next year, with a more advantaged class, it was at the top. The message here is that the statistical controls simply did not work. Uh, turning to my second topic here, I'll show you just two released items from the California standards tests, one each from history and algebra. Uh, before each item, I'll show you the standard that it was supposed to measure. I have many examples like this, and I could easily find examples from other states that would nail home the same message as well. In the interest of time, just these two will serve to make the point. Here's a U.S. history standard for 11th graders. I'm sorry the text is so small. The standard says to discuss the significant domestic policy speeches of various presidents on a variety of different important policy topics. For now, though, just notice the verb discuss. Next, here's the item. We know that, and it's a multiple choice item, so there can't really be discussion, but what this item actually calls for is just paired associate learning. A chart with rows for each president, columns for each policy area, and names of programs in the cells would be all a teacher would need to nail any item for, of this kind for this objective. Turning to algebra, since these are multiple choice items, you know students won't be constructing or formulating anything, but still, I'm sorry, naming the procedure is just not the same as doing the math. The Park and SBAC assessment tests are going to be better than the ones we have now. The ones we have now, in many ways, aren't all that bad. Smart, thoughtful people have built the tests we have. Just saying we need better tests is not going to do any good. That's been tried again and again. The teachers we have now are good for some purposes. The consortium tests should be much better but they're not going to be good enough that we should make turning, getting high scores on these tests into the de facto goal of schooling. The tests will be better, they're not going to be good enough for that. Turning to this third bullet, conditionally random assignment of students to teachers is a critical assumption in value-added models. Depending on the exact model and the interpretations intended, conditionally random assignment of teachers to schools may also be required. Random assignment is critical because some students are harder to teach than others. If students were randomly assigned to teachers, then those student differences would add noise, but using more data per teacher would go a long way toward fixing the problem. In other words, if these effects for different teachers averaged out to zero for each teacher, then you know, when we average across more teachers, they, they tend to wash out. The problem, though, is that some teachers get more than their share of hard to teach students again and again. Assignment of students to teachers is not random, and this problem then is one of systematic error. Measurement ex experts would talk about this as a problem of bias, not a problem of imprecision. It's a problem of validity, not a problem of reliability. This bias doesn't go away when you average across more teachers, I mean, you average across more students, excuse me. It gives a systematic advantage year after year, class after class, to teachers in some schools or working with some kinds of students, and a systematic disadvantage to others. There's much better documentation of the non-random assignment of teachers to schools, and just as some students are harder to teach than others, some schools are harder to teach in than others. On my next slides, I have just two quotes that appeared in this Economic Policy Institute brief I mentioned before. I strongly agree with these quotes, but I do want to acknowledge here that the field is not quite unanimous on these questions. A few respected methodologists go further than most in supporting value-added model use for teacher evaluation. If you read the fine print and look at all of the caveats, then you find that actually there's not as much disagreement as it might appear at first blush. But um, I've been around this business long enough. I'm tired of hearing people say that un in, unlike our predecessors, we do not intend for any unintended consequences. First quote, 2003 RAND research report, Dan McCaffrey, Dan Koritz, J.R. Lockwood, and Laura Hambledon had this to say, since 2003, much more research evidence has accumulated and it's continued to show the same problems as were found in the earlier studies. 
In, the 2000, in 2009, the National Research Council's Board on Testing and Assessment issued a letter report directed to Secretary Arne Duncan commenting on the department's proposed race to the top fund. That letter urged strong cautions concerning evaluated models, strongly urged further research and pilot studies before mandating any operational use. I should mention that as chair of BOTA, I was involved in the preparation of that letter report. And since that report was issued, the evidence has continued to accumulate that, and again, it's been consistent that these models have serious problems. In closing, teacher effectiveness estimates with statistical controls for prior achievement are better than estimates based on unadjusted end-of-year student test scores. And they may be of real value if used appropriately, but they're not magic, and I believe they're being seriously oversold. I can still hear a teacher I met over 20 years ago saying these words. I have a great fear that thoughtless implementation or over-reliance on test score-based teacher evaluation models may underline the undermine the education of our most vulnerable children. Thank you. <laughs>